Oh, di atas segala galanya, Tuhan. You're above and beyond everything, Jesus. Tangan sekali lagi yang luar biasa bagi Tuhan yang luar biasa Bapak Ibu sudah sekalian hari ini adalah hari yang luar biasa untuk kita bisa berdoa bersama-sama Tapi dalam kesempatan kita berdoa bersama malam hari ini kita nggak sedang memaksa Tuhan melakukan sesuatu untuk kepentingan kita saja Kita nggak hanya sedang meminta Tuhan untuk melakukan sesuatu hanya bagi keinginan kita saja Tapi tema kita hari ini adalah tentang let your will be done Tentang datanglah kerajaanmu, jadilah kehendakmu dalam setiap kehidupan kita. Sesuatu hari waktu Yesus dia ngajar tentang berdoa. Lalu dalam Matius 6 ayat yang ke-10 dicatat tentang salah satu kata dari ketika Yesus mengucapkan dan mengajarkan tentang berdoa. Dia bilang, belajar berdoa untuk juga bilang, datanglah kerajaanmu, jadilah kehendakmu. Surah di momen kita sedang berkata, datanglah kerajaanmu, jadilah kehendakmu. Ada sebuah perubahan prioritas yang sedang terjadi. Ada sebuah shifting prioritas. Bukan hanya mau kita, tapi maunya Tuhan. Bukan hanya keinginan dan desire hati kita, tapi tentang keinginan dan desire-nya hati Tuhan. Bukan lagi tentang kekuatan kita saja, tapi tentang kuasa Tuhan yang harus terjadi dalam kehidupan kita semua. Tapi seringkali dalam kondisi kita baik-baik saja, kadang kita takut untuk mengucapkan doa ini. Jadilah kehendakmu, karena kita takut hidup kita diinterupsi, lalu prioritas kita harus berubah. Kadang dalam kondisi keadaan kurang baik, karena kita udah begitu fokus sama keinginan dan mau kita aja. Susah bagi kita untuk berkata, jadilah kehendakmu. Karena kita takut kedaulatannya harus terjadi atas kehidupan kita. Tapi kenapa nggak malam hari ini sama-sama, biar momen hari ini jadi momen kita merubah prioritas. Bukan hanya kehendakku, tapi kehendakmu yang jadi. God, I trust your will. Bukan keinginanku, tapi hatimu. God, I trust your heart. Bukan kekuatanku, tapi kuasamu. God, I trust your power. Terjadilah, terjadilah, jadilah kehendakmu di bumi seperti di surga. Come on, sing this together. Lift up your hands. Angkat tangan kita sama-sama. Woo! 
Good morning, CBC family. Just want to welcome you to our online church service today. We will also be partaking the Holy Communion together this morning to remember the death of our Lord Jesus Christ and to proclaim His salvation, His resurrection, and the new life that He offers to us. Kindly prepare the communion elements and let us prepare our heart to worship the Lord together. 
And before we begin, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we are able to come together as your church on this digital platform to praise you and to worship you. We want to bring our songs of praise and thanksgiving unto you. We welcome your presence into our homes, into your church, and wherever we are, may you bind our hearts together with your love. Come Holy Spirit, fall afresh on us and stir within us a great desire for you. O oh Lord, may we experience you in a special manner today as we worship you with all our heart. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. i 
Uh, dearly beloved, uh, let's prepare our heart for the Holy Communion. Uh, before that, let's read a passage from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23 to verse 26. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. And the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord dead until He come. And so, uh, dearly beloved, when you read this passage again and again, the Lord Supper consists of two elements, the bread and the wine. It is a memorial of Jesus' suffering and death and a prophecy of His second coming. And the reason we regularly celebrate communion is because Jesus commanded us to do this in remembrance of Him. And how do we do that? Now, to truly remember the sacrifice of Jesus, we relive His birth, His life, His agony, His suffering, His death as much as humanly possible and rededicate our child to his obedient service. And to remember something was to go back in one mind and recapture as much of the reality of the event as possible. Our deliverance from our sin and from our death. And so we do that with two timber, the bread and the wine. First, the bread. Now, communion means in common. So bread is one of life's most common things. And God wanted His Son to be common. God wanted Jesus to be available to all. And in John chapter 6, verse 35, Jesus said, I'm the bread of life. He who come to me will never go hungry. The bread is a symbol of Christ's body that He gave so that we could have life. Break is also a symbol of our connectedness. And Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, immediately after his famous chapter 11, teaching on the Lord's Supper, that all believers belong to one body, the body of Christ. So when we partake of the communion, we are remembering Christ's suffering on our behalf and our participation in his body as a group of believers, we are common saviour, Jesus Christ. Secondly, the wine. Now, in Community Baptist Church, we take communion with grape juice. And the fruit of the wine is a timber that illustrates that Christ is a sort of life. And we treat a work that. Jesus said in John chapter 15, I am the true wine. And consider just how you get wine out of the grape. You crush it. You have to literally smash it. And this is the symbolism of the wine. Jesus was literally crushed. His flesh torn open. His hair pulled out. And his blood was shed for the forgiveness of our sin. And so dearly beloved, when we partake of the grape juice, we are remembering how much Christ suffered for us. His blood that was shed on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins and to be made right with God. Amen. And so, what does communion do for us? I trust today you remember that it reminds us of the new covenant God made with us at Calvary. It reminds us that we are part of the body of Christ even though we are meeting in different homes. But we are connected with one another in the body of Christ. A body that goes beyond any boundary. It keeps us focused on the work of the cross. 
It reminds us that God has promised to return someday to take us back to heaven forever. So let us now prepare our heart to partake of the communion together. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you. Thank you for the great make available in Christ Jesus for our redemption. And through participating in the Holy Communion today, we should to proclaim the Lord that to teach, to share, to testify, and to talk about His salvation that is available in Him. The forgiveness available in Jesus Christ for our sin and the enabling grace of God for our sanctification and holiness in the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. So we come before you humbly to this communion table with thanksgiving, we pray in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. So dearly beloved, the Holy Communion is open to each and every one of us who has accepted Jesus Christ as our Saviour and Lord. So let's take a moment to examine our heart as we prepare for the Holy Communion. Let us partake of the Holy Communion in a manner that is pleasing unto the Lord. And let us look inward in the light of the promise of God. We declare that if we confess our sin, He is faithful and righteous to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from all our unrighteousness. And let's confess and repent of our sin before we meet at the Lord table, shall we? Let's pray. Our Father, we come to the communion table and we are resting only in the worthiness of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we look at the emblem that we are going to hold in our hand, the emblem that reminds us of our Saviour, that may we remember why He died, to cleanse, to heal, to satisfy your righteousness and justice. We remember your infinite love and grace, and may we receive the assurance of forgiveness, eternal life, and the hope of glory. And from this communion table, we look forward to your soon coming again in glory. Fill us with the peace and purposes as we serve you in all our world. In Jesus' victorious name. Amen. Amen. May I invite you to hold the bread and the cup in your hand and to stand together with me. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, I take authority to sanctify the bread and the cup we are holding in our hand with the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Dearly beloved, the bread in your hand represents the body of Jesus that was given to us. Let us partake together in remembrance of Jesus. Dearly beloved, the cup in your hand represents the blood of Jesus that was shed on the cross for the forgiveness of our sin. Let us party together in remembrance of Jesus. Shall we pray? Abba Father, from this communion table, we look forward to your soon coming again. Fill us with joy and peace in believing so that each one of us may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Thank you, worship team, for leading us in a wonderful time of worship. Let us now pray and commit our tithes and offering to the Lord. Father, we thank you that you have given us all things richly to enjoy, your provision for our daily needs like our food, our shelter, our clothes, as well as the money and resources that you give us. We come before you right now and offer our tithes to you as an offering of our worship. We thank you and we praise you, Lord, for allowing us to reach this world even through our resources. In Jesus' name, Amen. 
Let us now prepare our hearts to hear the word this morning. Good morning, church. I'm thankful and grateful that I'm able to be with you this morning. Today, we're going to continue our study on the book of uh, 2 Timothy. And this is the last segment in which we will consider uh, the letter of Paul to Timothy. Just to recap, just five Sundays ago, I started this series by, with this topic called Fanning the Flame. If you remember, I used the acronym of the word FIRE, which means that we need to have faith in the Lord. And secondly, we need to ignite the Spirit of God that God has given to each one of us. And secondly, we need to rekindle the gifts of the Holy Spirit, which God has given to us. Each one of us will have at least one. And then we need to exercise them. And then uh, Elder Beng Tion then took it on in the second study on guarding the gospel. And then um, uh, Pastor Reynolds then took us on to enduring hardship. And Pastor Mel would take us on how we handled the word. And last Sunday, Pastor Richard exhorted us to choose a godly life. And today we're going to deal with this very important subject, how to finish well. And let us first turn to the Word of God. I'm just going to read the first 11 verses of 2 Timothy. And so you, your Bible, wherever you are, with your home, with your family members, just turn to the Word of God and you may read, read it aloud together with me. I'm reading from the NIV version. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. And Paul was giving this charge to Timothy. In verse 2 he says, Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But to you, Timothy, keep your head in all situations. Endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Discharge all the duties of your ministries. And verse 6, he says, For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time for my departure is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for His appearing. Do your best to come to me quickly. For Demas, because he loved this world, has deserted me and has gone to Thessalonica. Christians have gone to Galatia and Titus to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you because he is helpful to me in my ministry. Let us pray together as we seek the Lord. Lord, we ask of you this morning, even as we come to your word, that you speak to each one of us by your Holy Spirit. Lord, may you bring out from your word the Rima word and breathe life into each and every one of us. And Lord, may we just not be your hearers of your word, but Lord, we want to be doers of your word. And therefore, we ask of you, Lord, that you bring something that is important to each and every one of us for each of our special circumstances and bring to life your instruction, your direction, your correction for each and every one of us. And so we commit ourselves to you this morning. I ask, O oh Lord, that you take whatever you have put into my mouth, O oh God. May, may they be 
something that will edify the body of Christ this morning. We ask all this through Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Saviour. Amen. Ravi Zechariah, one of the most pronounced servants of God who have gone to glory this year, said this, Beginning well is a momentary thing, but finishing well is a lifelong thing. You know, it's often very exciting to start a new project. I'm not one people like myself who have been involved in construction. It's always very exciting to be given a, a new task, a new job. I remember way back in the 90s, I was given this job of the Grand Hyatt of Kuala Lumpur. It was exciting. But little did I know that it took me 17 years to complete the job. In between the 17 years, we hit two financial crises. The 1997 uh, Asian financial crisis And then in 2008 The subprime crisis And so it was not until 2012 that the project was completed But looking back I'm extremely proud of that project But it has not been easy you know, Similarly, getting married is exciting you know, It's relatively easy But staying married To, drug, to all our struggles the challenges that we have to face, the adjustments we need to make, the various trials and sometimes are often not easy. And so we have to cope with that. So staying married is not easy. Just two days ago, May and I, we just had our 44th anniversary. I want to thank God for all these 44 years of His goodness. But it has not been easy, especially during the early years of our married life. We have to raise our three boys, see them through schools and universities. And in between, we got to have our own job to do. And it has not been easy. But it's by the grace of God that we are able to sustain. And right now, we have reached a stage that we are just enjoying each other every day of our life. Not the same is true for our Christian life. Now, becoming a Christian is relatively easy. All we need to do is acknowledge Jesus as our personal Lord and Savior. We admit that we are a sinner before God. And we receive Jesus into our life, thanking Him for the blood that was shed on our behalf. We cannot work for our salvation or do anything to qualify because it's the gift of God when we trust in Him. But then comes the hard part. To be able to hang it out there as a Christian in the world that is so hostile towards God and towards God's people. You know, the world is constantly, constantly dangling in front of us all that it has to offer in opposition to the things of God. And then from within each one of us, our flesh entices us to forsake Christ in order to gratify our own desires. And devil, the devil will hit us from temptations after temptations. You know, the real test of our faith is, are we able to endure, to persevere? You know, genuine faith in Christ perseveres towards the finishing line. And many people have said that the Christian life is not a 100-meter dash, it is a marathon race. Finishing a marathon well is not easy. You know, when you see a young uh, a man Springing across the finishing line, you ought to think and to find out for this person how he can achieve all this. I love this picture of an old man, you know, running the marathon and finishing the race. You know, the Apostle Paul was such a man. You know, when he was writing this, it was as if he was about to cross the finishing line and with some energy to spare. And in his mind, he just jogs back to where Timothy was and, and Timothy seems to be losing some steam and he exhorts him to keep running and to finish well and from our text it is clear that we see Paul is looking at death as something that is going to come and very real but he can stare death in the face and now when Timothy when he was reading this for the first time perhaps he was moved in emotions and there were tears in his eyes and these words that Paul wrote to him must have kept him sobered for some time. With the reality that Paul is about to depart from the sin and about to pass this baton to him, 
and he had to continue this race and to finish well. You read the words of Paul, it's not like one that has been discouraged or a broken old man. Indeed, when you read it, there was no despair, there was no regret, there was no defeat, no cynicism, no fear as he faces his imminent execution. You know, when we look at Paul, his calm assurance is all the more startling when you consider the circumstances that he was in. He was in prison in Rome, and we all heard it so many times. Even the words of our prison today would be like a five-star hotel compared to the prison in Rome at that time. You know, Paul's cell was in the dungeon. It was dark, it was damp, and you, you can only reach that by a rope from the hole up on the roof or a ladder that is put through the roof, uh, a hole in the roof. No windows, no lights, no toilet, no furniture, no running water. And he had to sit on the, on the hard floor in the cold darkness and during the stench even of his own excretion or his own urine. Not only the circumstances inside the cell, but outside is also not much encouraging to Paul. Many seem to have deserted him, as we read in the passage just now. And Paul even had to confront with the danger that the church is facing. There are many false teachers that is hovering the church, the young church that Paul has founded. And Paul has labored for the past 30 years or more to preach the gospel around the Roman Empire. And at this point of his life, it was at best perhaps some small group of believers scattered here and there. And yet this man was clearly at rest. And he was confident the way he has spent his life and calmly assured even as he faces the prospect of death. We read in verse 9, chapter 4, that Paul sent Tychicus to Ephesus to bring so that Timothy can come to, to Rome to see him. And God will soon remove Paul off the scene and Timothy will take his place to continue the leadership of the church at that time. We ask ourselves this question, what does the Apostle Paul have to teach us about finishing well? And let us look at verses 6, 7 and 8. And here we find that Paul used the words, I am, in verse 6, which speaks about the present situation. And in verse 7, he says, I have. <coughs> and verse 8, he says, now there is in store for me in the future. And so I want to use this and help us to understand what Paul is trying to bring to us in order to finish well. So firstly, to finish well, we must keep in view of the present. Secondly, to finish well, we must keep in view of what has happened in the past. And thirdly, to finish well, we keep in view of the future. So firstly, to finish well, we must keep in view of what we are doing now. In verse 6, Paul says, For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time for my departure is near. When we consider this verse, there are three words which will help us to understand how we can finish well in the present. Firstly, is the word reproduction. Secondly, is the word sacrifice. And thirdly, is the word departure. Now, Paul could finish well because he had reproduced himself in the lives of others. In verses 1 to 5, Paul gave this apostolic charge to Timothy you know, to preach the gospel. And in verse 6, he says, I, and he contrasts that with the word you he uses for Timothy in verse 5. You keep your head in all situations and your hardship. Do the work of evangelists. Discharge all your duties, the duties of your ministry. And verse 6, he says, I am already being poured out like a drink of it. And so the flow of thoughts in Paul's mind is like this. Timothy, preach the gospel, the word of God, even in the face of opposition. Because I'm about to die. 
I'm handing you now this baton, this torch, so that you can carry on. You know, dying is easier when you know that you are leaving behind a number of people who can carry on with the work of the ministry because of your influence in, your, in their lives. Now, each of us got to really ask ourselves this question, am I working on that task? And we are talking here about obeying Jesus' great commission here, to make disciples of others. And that commission applies to every Christian at some level. Even though you are a very young Christian, that commission applies to you too. If you know Christ as your Savior and you are walking with Him, then He calls you to make disciples of others. You know, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, Paul was saying, The things that you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses and trust to rely people who will also be qualified to teach others. I like this uh, chart that our senior pastor, Renault uh, presented to us, which speaks of the process of discipleship. It starts from the I, from me, and then pass on to you, and in Paul's case, to Silas, to Timothy, Aquila, and Dr. Luke. And then to the reliable and the faithful people, to the community of God's people in the Corinthian church, to Apollos, and to the Ephesian church, and, men, and to the wider people in the region, many who are in the Kaya. And so this concept of discipleship got to start from where we are. So beginning from our home, every Christian parent ought to be waging an all-out campaign to train his or her children to know Jesus and to walk with the Lord. It begins by setting our lives as an example. You know, Pastor Richard last Sunday reminded us, if we want to live a godly life, we must look for someone that we can emulate. And so at home, the parents are the role model for our children. You must walk in reality of, of the person of Jesus so that you can impart the presence of God into the lives of your, of your children. And then beyond your immediate family, you should have a vision to reproduce yourself in the lives of others, in your workplaces, in your schools, wherever you are. Godly men will be handling, handling the Word of God and passing on that faith to younger men in the faith, as 2 Timothy 2, verse 2 exhorted us. And in Titus chapter 2, verses 3 to 5, Paul exhorted godly women to train younger women in the things of God. So that when you are gone, there should be others who will carry on with the ministry of the gospel because of your influence into their lives. And so that's what reproduction means to be able to influence others so that they would do and continue with the work of the ministry. Second word is sacrifice. Paul could finish well because he viewed his life as an offering to God. No, Paul did not view his immune excuse as a cruel tragedy or as an unfair treatment in view of his many years of service. But he saw it as a culminating offering of a sacrificial life. Now, in the Old Testament, after the sacrificial lamb had been placed on the altar, and just before they lit it on fire, the priest would come and pour on it about a quarter or about 250 mils of wine. And this was like a final sacrifice poured out on the existing sacrifice that is laid on the altar. And so Paul viewed his own death as like that drink offering that has been offered on his life that has been the living sacrifice presented to God. And now he says his death will be like a drink offering poured on top of that. And this means to finish well, you need to view your life as an act of sacrificial worship to God. Now Paul puts it in Romans 12 verse 1, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, and this is your true and proper worship. You know, we often 
ask ourselves, what is our purpose of serving? You don't serve Christ in order to get praise or acclaim from others. Yes, there are people who come around and say thank you and give you some encouragement. You serve Christ as an act of worship towards God. If others turn away from you or even badmouth you, would you still continue serving? As many have done that towards Paul. Or if your earthly reward is for a lifetime of dedicated service, but that lifetime reward is to get your heads cut off, will you still offer your life as a living sacrifice to God? So that is a question that we need to ask. And therefore, Paul view his imminent death is like a drink offering. In other words, to finish well, you view yourself as expendable in God's service. So Paul could finish well because he saw himself as expendable, as a drink offering, despite all his accomplishment in his ministries. Now, in the similar tone and in the similar language, Paul wrote to the Ephesians elders in Acts chapter 20, verse 24. And he reads like this. I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task that the Lord Jesus has given me. The task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. And this is what Paul all he sought for his own life is to preach the gospel, nothing more. And so, when we look at our life in the present, it is not only about sacrifice. It is not only about knowing who God is. But Paul viewed his life, view his impending death as a departure. In verse 6, he says, The time for my departure is near. Brothers and sisters, when we read the Bible, death is never a cessation of our existence. But rather, it's a separation of our soul from the body. It is a departure. Now, I check it out, and the word departure used in the original Greek word was the word analua. And the word analua has got its vivid picture. Firstly, it's a picture that describes the unyoking of an animal from a plow or from the cart. You know, it means that death is the end of our labor, at the end of our toil, the end of our burdens. Just like the animal have to carry the burden to plow the field and now the yoke is released from them. And the second picture is a picture of loosening the bonds of the prisoner. So that is a release from the bonds of this corruptible body. It's a release. It's a loosening of that bondage. And thirdly, it's used like the loosening of the ropes of a soldier's tan. And this suggests that the battle is over, the victory is won, and now we are ready to go home. That's why you dismantle the ropes of the tan. And fourthly, the word is also used, the loosening of the mooring ropes that tie, that secure the ship to the harbour. And when the ship is about to go, you have to loosen it. And so death to Paul is like the earthly ship that's leaving the shores of this stormy earth and is being released towards the always calm, peaceful port of heaven. And what a beautiful picture Paul has used in the word departure. And therefore, if we have Paul's view of death as a departure, you will be able to finish without fear, without regrets, but with great anticipation, knowing that to depart and be with Christ is so much better. That's what Philippians 1 verse 23 tells us. And Paul says in Philippians 1 21, For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. And so to finish well, we need to keep focus. Paul's view of the present, the present ministry is to reproduce, to take heed of the commission that God has given to us to make disciples of others, to make disciples of all nations. 
and to present our own life as a sacrifice. And even as we view our imminent death departure, it will be like a drink offering. And to look at our death as nothing but a departure from our earthly toil, a departure from this corruptible body, and to be released towards the presence of God. And secondly, to finish well, Paul had to keep in view of the past. In verse 7, he says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race and I have kept the faith. Now, we often quote this verse at funerals. No, but Paul was writing this. He was able to look back into his past and say confidently that he has done well. Not that he's patting his own, uh, at the back of his own shoulder. And he's not implying that there have not been mistakes or times of discouragement or even failures. Of course there are. But through all the problems and trials, Paul had, aban- had not abandoned his post. He has not quit, but he has stayed on the battle. He had not dropped out of the race when the course gets tough. And he could say, I've done what God has called me to do. Not to be able to join Paul in saying at the end of our lives, we must be able to make three statements that Paul says here in verse 7. And Paul uses the metaphors of soldier, the athlete, and a farmer, which Paul had earlier used uh, in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 to 7. And Paul says, firstly, I have fought the good fight. And he's using the metaphor of a soldier in the battle. It conveys that the Christian life is not a Sunday picnic, but rather it's a constant struggle against the forces of evil. It's not just any fight, but the good fight, the fight of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ for the glory of God and the salvation of souls. Now, when we come to the end of our life, will we be able to look back and say, I have been involved in that struggle for the cause of Christ? If we cannot say so, perhaps we have been living our lives primarily for our own comfort, our own affluence, spending our time, our money, our resources on the pursuit of our own agenda, our own dream. We may come and join the church on Sunday service every week, but if our purpose in life is to make ourselves comfortable and as as affluent as we can be, then can we say we are involved in the struggle for the cause of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ? I trust that many of us will live our life for the purpose of building up the body of Christ, extending the kingdom of God through our labors and our time, our money, according to the gifts that God and the resources that God has given to us, the blessings He has poured into our life, the opportunity He has given to us, then we can confidently say when we are perhaps at the tail end of our life that we are involved in that struggle for the cause of Christ. What a fulfilling thing it will be when it comes to that time when we are about to die, to be able to look back our past and be able to say, I've been involved in that great struggle for the cause of Christ. The second metaphor that Paul uses is, I've finished the race. Here Paul is using the metaphor of an athlete who proclaimed, I have not dropped out of the race. And Paul is referring here to a, a long race like the marathon. The word original marathon comes from the geographic place an actual place called Marathon, where a decisive battle took place between Greece and Persia in 490 BC. And the legion has been told that after the battle, one of the soldiers, a Greek soldier, ran the distance from Marathon to Athens, roughly about 21 to 25 miles, with the news that they have won the battle. But as he reached destination, he felt dead. And so based on that Legion, the modern marathon race began between Marathon and Athens in the year 1896 Olympics. And it was subsequently lengthened to present day. We have 26.2 miles or 42 kilometers in the 1908 Olympics. 
So we all know that those who began with our Christian life, with a flourish of activity and enthusiasm, I know that some even went into full-time ministry, attended Bible college, and yet when trials and disappointments hit them, they lost steam and they dropped out. How unfortunate. Sometimes we may need to take a break or take a sabbatical from serving. That's fine. In order for us to be refreshed, to be renewed, because some of us, some missionaries do really face very tough situations and they need that short break in order to, to recover physically, emotionally, spiritually. But then we need to get back into the race, of course. And we will never take a break from walking with the Lord. You know, in a marathon race, there's no such thing as an easy race. And we need to stop thinking that Christian life is all glory and effortless bliss. You know, there are prosperity gospel preachers out there who tell you, oh, the moment you trust in Christ, you know, heavens are open to you, all the blessings will come to you. Yes, we do not deny God will bless us. But have we forgotten that Jesus has said, if we will follow me, come, take up your cross. Take up your cross. There is joy. And yet there are many trials that require endurance. And so we have to make up our mind to be able to hang in with the Lord through the good time as well as the bad times. So that we can look back at the end, like Paul says, I have finished the race. And the third thing that Paul uses is the metaphor of a farmer, I have kept the faith. You know, just as a farmer who faithfully plowed the field and knowing that he's going to get his reward. At the end, at the harvest time, and he said, I've kept the faith. And several times in this letter, Paul has written to Timothy and he used the word to guard what has been entrusted to him in 1 Timothy 6, chapter, verse 20, and 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 and 14. And Paul here is referring to the truth of the gospel, the core doctrines of the Christian faith. And when we did that on the study on guarding uh, the gospel truth and, and it really means that because one of the things that will keep us staying in order to know the truth so when Paul says that Timothy keep I have kept the faith he means that he has carefully guarded the truth about Jesus Christ and that God has entrusted to him he has not been swayed by all forms of other teachings of errors about Christ. Some say, no, Christ will not, uh, has not resurrected, which was circulating during those days. But Paul has kept his life and his teaching to sound doctrine. You can't keep your faith if you are unclear about what you believe. To be able to look back your life and echo Paul's so I've kept the faith, you need to be clear the essential, the fundamental doctrines of your faith. I've taken this slide from Pastor Renault. He says, we are faced with many challenges in our modern day. Not only we have the ongoing you know, pandemic, we have all those other threats. We have to deal with the social ills of our community, of our society, of our nation, corruption, injustice. We are faced with the challenges of the economy. And we are in the church, we are faced with all the, all the uh, uh, occults and all the cultic uh, teachings and, and the different uh, doctrines that bring and have persuade and draw many young people away from, from the truth. And at every situation, we have to choose and we have to make the right choice and our faith, our understanding of what the gospel is will help us to determine, to stay on the course of what we believe. That's why Paul said, I have kept the faith. Our faith is just as much under attack in our day today as it was in Paul's day. And so we need to establish our faith deep-rooted in sound doctrine knowing what we believe so that we are not tossed around by all forms of winds of false doctrine that seems to be, you know, hovering around us today. So Paul could finish up because he could look at his present life, he saw his present ministry as reproduction, his present life as a sacrifice, 
and his impending death as a departure. Then he looked at the past, he saw that he had been involved in the struggle for the cause of the gospel like a good soldier. And he had not dropped out of the race like a good athlete and he has guarded the truth of the gospel like a good farmer. But he also looked into the future. So Paul could finish well because his hope to meet with the Lord, the righteous judge. You know, while there ought to be elements of awe or even fear, when we think about one day we're going to stand before our Lord, there will be a sense of perhaps nervousness. But the prevailing emotion that we ought to have is that of expected hope. Not the world around us, when they think about standing before a righteous judge, when you hear the word, oh, you have been uh, summoned to go to court to appear before a judge, you'll be fear, you'll ask, what, what, what's the reason? There'll be a feel of fear. But for Christians, we all should love the appearing before the Lord. That's why Paul wrote in Romans 8, verse 1, he says, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Now, when we all stand before the Lord because of the blood of Jesus, the Lord does not look upon us as a con one that has been condemned, but He looks upon us with the righteousness that has been imputed upon us by our Lord Jesus Christ. That's why Jesus says in John chapter 5, verse 24, He says, The one who believes in Him does not come into judgment but has passed out of death into life. Yes, salvation is God's free gift by His grace, apart from any merits on our part. If we put our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, we do not need to fear of the final judgment. The reason is that we will not be condemned on the judgment day. It's not because we have earned it by being a good person, Rather, is by the finished work of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have satisfied God's perfect righteousness. When we trusted in Him, God imputed His righteousness upon us on the account of His Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. And so the hope of meeting the Lord, the righteous judge, will welcome us into heaven on the basis of God's righteousness that has been imputed upon us by His Son, our Lord Jesus. And so this hope should motivate us to love the Lord even more dearly and help us to run the race with endurance. That's why the Hebrew writer says in Hebrews 12, verses 2 to 3, he says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great crowd of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Let us run with perseverance. The race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before Him, He endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider Him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. What a joy, what a privilege God has placed us in. But what does Paul mean by the crown of righteousness? Is this a special reward given only to those believers who have lived especially righteous lives and not to all believers? Or is it the reward of eternal righteousness given to all believers who have already been justified by faith? I know there are several views on this, but let me suggest two views. Those in favor of the view that this is a special reward is that is the word crown refers to a wreath. You know, when you uh, finish the race, you are crowned with a wreath of, of olives, uh, uh, you know, branches. And, uh, and it, it is a crown that you receive. Not all will receive this crown, only those who have won, those who have finished the race. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 to 25, says, Do you not know in the race all runners run? But only one gets the prize. Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes the game goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. And similarly, Paul 
says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, anyone who competes as an athlete does not receive the victor's crown except by competing according to the rules. So the Bible teaches that while salvation is a free gift, God will reward us on the basis of our service for Him. You know, we all will come before the judgment seat. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, says, Well, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. And these rewards will differ among believers. And some will have their words burnt up because they were not found upon Christ and those who will save so that they will go through the fire of testing and others will receive a reward for their words. That's what 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 10 to 15 says that. You know, those who have built their lives on, on perishable things, you know, when the fire comes, it will all be burnt up. But those who have built their life on the firm foundation, that God has provided when it's come to the testing of fire and they will stand those testing and they will receive a reward. However, there is also another view that the crown of righteousness is given to all believers despite of whatever they do because he says that all who have loved his appearing seems to be a description for all believers. In this sense, it will be parallel to the crown of life that is given to all who love the Lord Jesus Christ. As James told us in James chapter 1, verse 12. Now, if Christ has saved you by the shedding of his blood for his sin, you long for the day when you see him. Perhaps Paul's meaning here is simply that even though his earthly judge, like the evil Emperor Nero, had wrongly condemned him, he knew that the righteous judge, our Lord Jesus, will vindicate him when he stood before him. This is the third time Paul had used the word that day in this letter. In the first chapter, verses 12 and verse 18, Paul have used that day. And now here in chapter 4, verse 8, he again uses the same word, that day. Now clearly Paul has li is living his life in view of that day. So that he, when he stands before the Lord Jesus Christ, he will have no fear, but with great expectant hope. So should we. The fact that we will stand before the Lord, the righteous judge, on that day should motivate us to live righteously, godly lives today. Whatever view you have with regards to the crown of righteousness, it should motivate you to move on to trust in the Lord. I will now bring to a conclusion. Perhaps the circumstances that you face today may be tough, may be difficult. Maybe you are considering dropping out of your Christian race. And some of you have been in ministry, you say, oh, I've done all that I could. It's time for me to take a break. You know, like Paul is calling out to you from his dungeon. Do you hear Paul saying to you, as he was saying to Timothy, don't quit. Don't give up. Keep going. You can finish well. By God's grace, you can finish well. And keep in view of the present. Just do whatever God has placed in your life right now. Reproduce yourself in others. Create the influence to carry on so that they can carry on the torch after you. View your present life as a sacrifice unto God. And your, even though you say, I'm now at the twilight of my life, I'm at the end of my life, view at that imminent death as like a drink offering. It's like an icing on top of your cake, so to say. And when you look your, deep, your death as an end of your life on earth to be like a departure, a release, a setting free to be with the Lord Jesus Christ. And not only that, you need to keep in view of what the past so that you can look back and say you have been engaging in the struggle for the cause of our Lord Jesus Christ. You have not dropped out of the race. You have not forgone the vineyard that God has given you. You have kept the faith and by guarding the truth of the gospel. And you keep in view of the hope of the future. Hallelujah. 
You know that one day you're going to stand before the righteous judge, our Lord Jesus Christ. You know that His grace is going to sustain you through whatever situation. He's not there to condemn you. He's there to reward you. And with that hope, we are to live in view of that glorious day. So brothers and sisters, if we live with Paul's focus by remaining in our faith, you will finish well. Amen. Let us pray together before we close. Hallelujah. Lord, we thank you. We praise you for what a life that you have given to me and to all my brothers and sisters. Lord, you have called each one of us out of the darkness of this world into your kingdom of marvelous light. And Lord, you have imputed upon us your purposes and your calling upon each one of us so that we, our life will become that living sacrifice that is being presented to you day after day until that day that you will call us home where you will be like a drink offering that will be offered to you like a sweet fragrance that is acceptable in your sight. And then you will call upon us, Thou art my faithful servant. Lord, we look forward to that day that you speak to us. We long to hear that word from you. But Lord, until that day, Lord, I pray and we pray, Lord, you keep us going. Help us to persevere through whatever circumstances of our life so that we will not give up. We will stay the course. We will engage in the battle that you have given to us. And Lord, by your grace, we will seek you day after day that you will strengthen us, renew us. You refresh us and deep within our spirit, man, and in our body, our minds, and our souls, so that, Lord, that we will be that man and woman that we willing to be a vessel fit for your purpose. So even as we depart from here, we pray for your blessing to upon each one of us, upon our family, our home. Bless us in our circle of influence so that, Lord, we can impart others who come to the saving knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So that, Lord, they too will be able to one day to carry on the torch for the spreading of the gospel. So that, Lord, that many more will come to that saving knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So help us, bless us, we pray, and ask in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Before you go, I may I leave you some three questions for you to discuss at your uh, life groups. Firstly, with whom are you currently trying to reproduce yourself? You know, it could be your children. You those of us who are married, who have got children of our own. Or it could be your own circle of friends for sisters, perhaps your own, your own uh, circle of friends or relatives. If your answer is no one, then pray and ask God to direct you to someone. Ask God. You know, every morning when we come to a devotion and we always have that item in our prayer, our Project Andrew, you know, thinking of someone, the Simon Peter in our lives. Secondly, does the idea of departing to be the cause you more fear or peace? If you feel fear, or you say, Lord, please lengthen my life, how can you change this? And thirdly, when you do most feel like dropping out of the race, you're getting tired, you're getting, you know, you're, you're letting off, there's no more steam. What can encourage you to keep going on in those times? Share with your, your group members or talk to someone about your own personal faith and ask God to help you in whatever situation. And so church, God bless you. Have a wonderful week ahead of you. Amen. never failing let mercy fall on me everyone needs forgiveness the kindness of a savior the hope of nations savior he can
can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save. service today. May the Lord's presence go with us and keep us well. See you again and have an awesome week.